Hey folks, how's it going? Today we're going to be looking at a few really simple optimization tricks that anybody can use no matter what skill level. So first we're going to dive into a few easy things here. The first is a trick with the blur top and I have seen this issue in so many projects. It is crazy. So oftentimes what happens is you'll have something like a movie or a camera feed and you're going to want to apply some blur to it. And what I often see happen is, is folks will create a blur and grab the filter size and just keep cranking it up. And you'll say, oh, I want more blur, more blur. And then, you know, maybe you start middle clicking and dragging and you're like, oh, yeah, I want more, more. And all of a sudden you end up with these very, very high filter sizes on your blur top. Now, the problem here is that as you increase the filter size, that's going to directly and proportionally increase the amount of GPU processes that are happening and GPU cycles that are being used to do this blur. So we can see here just doing a single blur on this count.mov file uh, at a larger resolution here, just as a good example, is taking almost two milliseconds, if not 2.2, 2.3 milliseconds of GPU time. And that's a lot of GPU time, especially as project frame rates are starting to go more and more commonly up to 60 FPS and above. So a really simple trick that everyone can do with this is when you're creating a blur top, take advantage of the other parameter that we have here, which is the pre-shrink. So for example, instead of turning the filter size all the way to 81 and having pre-shrink at one, I can actually achieve a very similar blur by doing a mix of increasing the pre-shrink size and increasing the filter size together. And we can see here, I have a pretty similar quality of blur between the two of them. It's not that one is any better than the other, but by using this pre-shrink, turning it up to four and not needing to turn up my filter size to a crazy high number, we can see that this exact same blur is taking less than half of the amount of GPU resources that our previous blur needed. So that's one really quick and easy trick that everyone can implement whenever you're using a blur top. Don't just grab the filter size and crank it all the way up. Try to balance increasing your pre-shrink and only slowly increasing your filter size. Now you will see you can't just go full pre-shrink because the pre-shrink will have a little bit of a different quality and oftentimes if you just increase your pre-shrink too high, you'll probably see some artifacts and things you don't like in the blur. So it's best to kind of move these sliders together Usually your filter size will still always be higher, but being able to bring in a little bit of that pre-shrink will A, get you the same result as before with much less GPU resources required. Now, the second really easy optimization thing that most folks can do is when you're doing compositing of different scenes inside of your project. So for example, if you're doing a stage show, a theater piece, or even VJing or anything like that, you might have a couple of different decks or scenes that you have to transition through. Now, a lot of the times there are many ways that people can do these transitions, but I see a lot of this kind of technique often, which is that you might have, and in this example, I've got three different movies feeding into something like three different level tops. And then whether you're using a MIDI controller or you create a user interface or however you create the control scheme, essentially what happens is people will end up decreasing the opacity on one scene while they simultaneously increase the opacity on another stream to create this kind of crossfade effect. Now, this can work visually well, but the problem here becomes that everything is always cooking. Because of how this composite is working, even though the opacity on two of our layers right now are fully zero and we can't see any of the pixels in our composite, the fact that they're connected like this, we can see that all of the lines here, not only the movies, if I middle click on them, I can see all of the movies are still loading and playing, all of the level tops are computing, just even for me just to see that one layer. Now, while this can have some benefits, what I often recommend to people is give the switch top a try. Switch top is a really, really useful operator because it functions similarly to how a cross top might function for these purposes, but it has one really cool benefit. So let me actually delete our composite and levels here. And I'm gonna plug all of my movies into my switch. Now on the switch, if you're doing these kind of cross fades, you'll have to turn on this blend between inputs button because if that's off, what you're gonna see is it just cuts between all of your different scenes. 
Now, if you are just cutting between scenes, one of the crazy great benefits of the switch top you're immediately going to notice is that only the source material that is passing through the switch is actually cooking. So you can see here that as this is on index zero, my first movie is passing through, so that wire is animated. But because I'm not even using any of the content from my second or third movie, we can see those are completely static, they're not cooking, that's gonna make this scene run so much more efficiently. Now, if you did need to do some crossfades, the switch actually has a really great system that helps kind of automatically optimize your network a little bit. So if I turn on the blend between inputs, what we're gonna see is now two of the wires are cooking. And the way this is set up is that always your current index and the next index are gonna be cooking. So even if you, you know, if you have five scenes or six scenes, this will automatically reduce that overhead by quite a bit because you'll only ever have two scenes cooking instead of in the previous method where you had all of your scenes always cooking. Now the nice thing is we can create a really simple control to do this kind of crossfade between the two. And you can see as I'm about to cross and hit index one here, it's automatically going to optimize and turn off the movie file that I have at the beginning there. So once I hit that index over to one, we can see that wire has stopped animating and now the middle wire and my next index after it are the ones that are cooking. So this is a great way that you can just easily create a cross fading effect between different scenes while also having touch designer help you a little bit with optimization behind the scenes. Now another common thing that I see really messes up a lot of folks is if you're dealing with lots of data, so whether this is social media data or data that you're importing from files or you're bringing down from maybe public data sets, is that a lot of the times folks are confused why their project starts to really drop frames just by having these tables exist. So a good example is, is let me set this project to 30 or 60 FPS here. And I have a table that has about 110,000 rows and nine columns. Feels like a lot of data, but it really isn't because you could get to the same amount of performance issues with a much smaller data once you start putting strings in there um, or any kind of more complex data. You'll see in this example, I just have a bunch of numbers. But the thing to know here is that every operator that has to render inside a touch designer is going to take a little bit of processing power. And as these operator viewers become more and more complex, they're gonna take more and more horsepower. So for example, right now, my system is holding a very steady 60 FPS, basically no matter what I do here. But the moment I activate the viewer on this table, all of a sudden we see it drop down to 59 and the more of the table that I actually reveal to my viewer we can see that the farther and farther my FPS drops and now just having, you know, a bunch of columns and rows of numbers on screen is make, I can't even hold 50 FPS at this point barely. So one of the big tricks that you can use is if you're working with tables, especially large data tables, and this also applies for very large chops too. So if you have a trail chop or a record chop or even a file in chop and you're bringing in a lot and lot of samples and channels is just turn off the viewer. All of that data is still there. You can still process it as you normally would, but because Touch Designer doesn't physically have to render the viewer of it, all of a sudden you're gonna go back to performing at a high level. Now the final thing here is a, is a fun little trick and something a lot of people kind of don't think about, and that's the fact that a lot of input chops, you know, especially things like OSC in, MIDI in, um, any of these kind of network protocols, they are essentially always cooking. So in this example, I have on one side a constant chop with two simple parameters here, feeding into an OSC out, and then right next to it, I have the OSC in. So you can almost imagine that this left side is, is whether it's a different computer or a different project or even a different application sending some control data. And inside of Touch Designer here, I have my OSC in. But you can see even though none of these values are changing, the OSC in is always cooking, and that's gonna make everything after it always cook here. We can see the nulls cooking. I have a constant here that I've referenced the alpha to one of these channels. It's always cooking, and it doesn't even matter if I turn off the viewers on those chops, it's always cooking and sending that data down through my network. And this can cause issues because if you have something like a MIDI controller or OSC coming in, 
connected to all different effects in all different scenes, you may unknowingly be changing a lot of those different scenes without actually knowing it. So one nice trick that I like to do here is I set up a little script whenever I'm dealing with a lot of these kind of very heavy inputs like OSC and MIDI if my project is very big and heavy as well. And all of this script does is takes the channels as they change value from the OSC in or the MIDI in and writes them into a new constant chop. So just this simple act of having a chop execute in between my OSC input and a constant chop means that if the values aren't changing, my constant chop isn't getting updated, which means it's not cooking, which means that anything after it that needs any of the data also isn't cooking. So this can be great because what we can see here is in this example, this constant two, even though our value is always zero and not changing, it's constantly cooking. Now, if I go ahead and open up this code here so you can take a look at it, very simple, a couple of lines here. One is that we get the name of the operator that we wanna update. And in this case, we want to update constant three. So I'm gonna get op constant three dot par. Then I need to assign which parameter I want to update inside of constant three. And because we're using this nice set attribute function, what we can do is programmatically update whichever index of channel is changing on the input, we can find the corresponding constant chop channel as well. A bit of a tongue twister, but essentially every time channel zero changes, we're gonna overwrite channel zero's value. Every time the next channel changes, we're gonna overwrite the next channel. So by using the index of the channel, we can quickly match up which input channel needs to go to which output channel. So inside of our script here, we're gonna create a variable target parameter. And this is just a very, I would say, simple script that looks fancier than it is. All it does is it creates a string that says value because we know inside of a constant chop, all of our values are gonna be value zero, value one, value two. So it's going to start by creating a string value. And then I'm using the Python F string here, which is you'll know there's an F at the beginning and you'll see curly brackets inside of the expression. And then what I'm gonna do is grab the channel index of the channel that's changed on my OSC in, make sure that's an integer and add that onto value. And just like I was saying, so for example, if this first channel change, that is channel index zero, so that would get channel index zero added onto value, which would make value zero. We know that we're gonna update op constant three. And then we can use this set adder to say, okay, well go to op constant three's parameters, go to value zero, and pass the new value that we have coming in as the new value going out. And the way this ends up looking is if I go to my constant one and start changing some of these values, we can see that those values are getting written to my constant chop. Now the real benefit here is that if I was to overwrite this alpha parameter that I'm controlling directly from the OSC in with my constant, all of a sudden, my constant isn't cooking every frame because my value isn't changing every frame and that's not incurring extra cooks here. But if I was to go back and, for example, start changing the parameter around, whenever that value changes, it would appropriately be cooking and updating. So this is a really simple thing that you can do with any kind of input chop data that you might be using. So this could be, again, OSC in, could be uh, TCP, could be connect cameras, could be MIDI, could be really anything because a lot of these input chops will always be cooking. And just by adding a very simple script that takes the input values only when they change and then writes them into a new chop that you can kind of use as your main reference point for anybody that needs that data, that's gonna create a really nice and optimized system. So hopefully these few quick things can help you optimize your projects a little bit. Most of them are pretty easy to implement and really just become habit over time. Enjoy. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.